Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, KCHR is delighted to welcome you to this book launch of the book, Love and Revolution in the 20th Century, Colonial and Post-Colonial World, Perspectives from South Asia and South Africa. Uh, the book is edited by Patricia Hayes, Pramesh Lalu, and G.R. Nima. This uh, book launch will be chaired by chairperson of KCHR, Professor P.K. Michael Tarabin. I will quickly go through the schedule of the program. We will have brief introductory remarks about the book by the two of the editors, Professor Patricia Hayes and Professor Pranesh Lalu. This will be followed by the discussion of the book. Uh, our discussants today are Professor Uday Kumar of Center for English Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and Professor Sanil V, Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi. And uh, the discussion will be followed by comments by two of the contributors to the book, Professor Paolo Israel and Professor P. Sanal Mohan. Um, slightly different from what we have mentioned in the schedule, uh, we request the listeners, the audience, to please type in your queries and comments to the chat box. We will, this is for uh, the benefit of taking up maximum number of comments and queries as possible. And uh, after the contributors' comments, we will read out the responses from the audience. The editors uh, will respond to the, uh, the discussions and also to the comments in the chat box together. So this is the brief schedule of the program. Um, I once again welcome all of you to this uh, program. And I request Professor Michael Tarabin to please uh, take the, the proceedings. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, you have kindly found time to participate in this book launch of <clears throat> Love and Revolution in the 20th Century Colonial and Postcolonial World Perspectives from South Asia and Southern Africa edited by Professors G. Arunima, Patricia Hayes, Pramesh Lalu. And uh, I'm extremely happy and proud to welcome you all to this function organized by the Kerala Council for Historical Research, or KCHR for short, for very obvious reasons. One of the three distinguished editors of this valued publication is G. Arunima, our director, director of KCHR. I welcome her particularly, along with professors Patricia Hayes and I had an exhilarating time of reading this book, which addresses one of the most engaging subjects of contemporary relevance, linking love and revolution encapsulated in time, which could also be to caught from the volume itself a moment of pause and interval. I wish to welcome the editors to the launch. The discussion of the theme of the book is to be initiated by two <clears throat> well-known thinkers and writers of our times, Professors Odeya Kumar and V. Sen. The reputations that they have established in analytical rigor makes me confident <clears throat> that their specific contributions will further enrich the discussions on the book. I welcome them both to this gathering. The variety of contributions to this volume and its diversity adds depth and significance. 
two other contributors, Professors Paulo Israel and Sanel Mohan, another person who's also linked to the KCHR as its former director, are going to widen the perspectives of the discussion. Welcome to you both. Subjects of various nuances and interpretations are inherent in the way in which the book that is to be launched is presented. Even ruptures with conventional understandings and neat divisions into colonial and post-colonial are illustrated therein. The fact that this volume is part of a new series in transnational perspectives on the history of social movements make it extremely interesting to both social scientists as well as activists. I hope the launch will be rich in meaningful discussions. Thank you all in advance. And once again, welcome on behalf of KCHR. Thank you. May I request Professor Patricia Hayes to please uh, give her introductory remarks to the book. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues. Um, and it's such an honor to be hosted by the Kerala Council for Historical Research. We thank you all very warmly. It's wonderful to see uh, friendly faces again after so long. Um, particular thanks to our co-editor Anu for organizing this and leading this, this wonderful platform, opening it up for us. Um, I'm, I'm going to be very brief because we have a lot of ground to cover. And um, just to say a little bit about the background, um, the, the book arises from a series of workshops that we organized between 2010 and 2012, um, which were devoted to this pairing of love and revolution. Uh, which we had arrived at here in our setting in the University of the Western Cape in South Africa as a result of um, a sort of very um, interesting intellectual pressure that was coming up from below, as it were, um, through our interactions, especially with graduate students who were working on the histories of our liberation struggles in the subcontinent of South Africa. And um, through um, various uh, remarkable networks, uh, we had the amazing good fortune to be um, able to invite colleagues like um, uh, Professor G. Arunima, and um, others as well to join us for these uh, workshops on lab and revolution. Um, also in the background of that um, sort of that pairing, uh, this was preceded by another set of workshops earlier, which we had found incredibly productive uh, here in Cape Town around war and the everyday. So dealing with histories of political violence, dealing with problems of the new nation, um, which is something that my colleague Pramesh Lalu has been theorizing around for a very long time, the question of the post-apartheid, uh, the question of freedom. Um, so we had four workshops, first in Cape Town, one in Minnesota with our partners there, um, which is when uh, Professor Simona Sawney joined our enterprise um, and thence to um, Delhi in early 2012. 
And um, this was hosted at the Nehru Memorial Library, for which we are extremely grateful. Um, several of you present here today also participated in that remarkable workshop, um, which gave us a tremendous momentum. Um, and we ended off with a fourth workshop in Cape Town, uh, where we kind of celebrated the, the dialogues, the conversations that were emerging by embarking on a ship that took us into the bay um, where we could be in another environment. Um, so there are very, very memorable meetings, conversations, and um, intellectual account encounters across many relationships here. And the book is only a very small representative part of that, but we are very proud that we have been able to complete this book and now launch it um, with your assistance. Um, just to say a little bit about why this particular pairing of love and revolution, um, in a way it has to do with drawing on popular aesthetics, which um, in our situation in the subcontinent of Southern Africa, we're saying certain kinds of things about freedom and joy and happiness, and yet we were embedded in political struggles that in many ways with um, post-colonial and post-apartheid situations were turning out to, to have massive um, disappointments of expectations. And all of this freshness in our minds is what brought us to think about this pairing um, as a way to work not only with the political histories of it, but also to get at what um, Elizabeth Edwards has called affective, affective evidence. And um, the journey through the book, especially the introduction, is about the very slippery, very slippery nature of that pairing and how every author has worked with that differently. Um, I'm going to stop there because I'm keen to hear what Pramesh will say next. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And I will be brief because I'm keen to hear what uh, Sunil and Odea will have to say. So, so I'll also limit my, my comments. I want to say that you know, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to have been part of this enduring conversation for the past 10 years um, and to see this book uh, being published. And just to preface my comments by saying that, you know, during the time that the Center for Humanities Research at UWC was taking off, uh, this conversation uh, really set the terms for thinking the, the question of aesthetics and politics in our center. So, you know, we couldn't have wished for a better opportunity to launch the Center for Humanities Research as it coincided with a series of conferences and conversations with colleagues uh, in India, uh, but also in, in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, I've been given an opportunity uh, to, to have lots of space and time on my hands in, in, in Sharjah. So I've been thinking about a second iteration of this volume and I know my co-editors would be completely despairing at the, at the thought that I've, I've gone ahead and kind of used the time at my uh, disposal to think about another, another four conferences for the next 10 years. But I, I have been wondering, you know, what are the possible themes that emerge from this book that we might want to take up in a, in a subsequent iteration? And I want to just, you know, name them and perhaps, you know, think about um, the, the expansiveness of this volume and what it offers us as a set of future prospects for research and collaboration across uh, spaces um, that link, you know, institutions in sub-Saharan Africa with the Kerala Council for Historical Research um, and a range of other institutions. The first of these I wanted to point to was the kind of ways in which we haven't really, uh, you know, thought about in, an, in a collaborative way the intellectual inheritance of the post-colonial post predicament as it defines the current conjuncture. So the, the, there's something about the current conjuncture uh, which sets up, which gives us a range of questions which we share, but not in common. And it would be interesting to see what another iteration of love and revolution might offer us 
to think through the conjunctural moment now, to think the contemporary in its, in its uh, more precise sense. The second is the question of a stalled dialectic of discourse of liberation. It does seem to me that you know, many of the essays gesture towards a, a rising sense of despair um, and a need to kind of think beyond the limits of that despair. And so there's something about a stalled dialectic that is available to us in the pairing love and revolution that is iterated through the papers uh, presented in the in the volume that I think would be would be incredibly important to, to, to take up. And in particular, to think about how the affective and the aesthetic are folded into each other. So I think, you know, we've thought about aesthetics and politics, uh, affect and politics, but I would like to think to ask us to think about how the affective and the aesthetic are folded into each other and whether the you know the essays in this volume begin to open the space for us to think in that direction and then finally you know we've been overwhelmed over the last 20 30 years of post colonial studies to think about the tensions of empire and i really think you know that but you know we need a more affirmative rendering of the question that would recharge post colonial uh, theory criticism and perhaps it ought to set to work on the question of the episteme and politics. Um, and that, you know, there's, there, there's several essays in this volume that pave the way for, for that kind of inquiry to, to emerge. So I'm hoping that we'd have an opportunity to have another set of conversations beyond the first volume of Love and Revolution to see whether we might find in the space of this coupling of opportu an opportunity to recharge the post-colonial. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Patricia Hayes and Professor Dinesh Lale for uh, setting the stage for the discussion. With the chair's permission, uh, we will move on to the discussions. I request Professor Uday Kumar to please proceed. Thank you. <clears throat> um, let me begin by uh, thanking all friends at uh, KCHR. Uh, Professor Michael Terrigan, uh, Professor Arunima, Rachel Fashia, and all other friends and colleagues there for inviting me to be part of this uh, conversation around this truly wonderful book. There is something particularly appropriate about a conversation around this book, uh, because as Patricia said, the book itself emerged out of conversations. And I had the good fortune to be part of one particular moment of that, which is 10 years ago in 2012, in the workshop which is held in New Delhi. And what I remember very clearly, uh, and over the past couple of days when I was reading through the papers in the book, uh, the memories of that workshop vividly came back to me, was a kind of um, a rare atmosphere of uh, friendly, intense, collective thinking, unhurried thinking, which was very much in evidence in the conversations in the workshop. And this is very rare to find in the academic context any longer. And I was particularly struck by that. And when I read the, the volume, the images and that atmosphere of a collective thinking, where you think alone and think together, really came across to me. So I hope that in this discussion and in the other events you have around the book, and probably in the workshops which uh, Pramesh is envisaging at the moment, this spirit of conversation and thinking together can be extended and taken forward. Uh, and I was struck then, as I am now, by the choice of love and revolution as the twin signs under which this thinking about the present and thinking about a transnational historical conjuncture is being carried out. And this, of course, also involves uh, a rethinking of the ideas of love and the ideas of revolution. I would say that in, it involves a kind of defamiliarization of these seemingly familiar concepts. We have to approach love as if we do not know what it is, and we have to approach revolution as if we do not know what it is. And this is one of the work uh, that this conversation and this volume 
uh, seeks to do. It is not that the bringing together of love and revolution, whether we call it juxtaposition, convergence, or mutual interruption, was unfamiliar. In Kerala, for instance, the entry of the trope of romantic love into narratives of revolutionary work was part of a strand of left imagination for a long time, uh, notably from the 1950s, from the play uh, Ningal in a Communist Aki or You Made Me a Communist, uh, which is also seriously criticized by some of the major communist political thinkers of the time, you know, especially about the introduction of the romantic plot into what was actually a, a play about uh, uh, communist struggles. And then in the 1970s, we had a strand of uh, revolutionary poetry, which again brought tropes of romantic love and tropes of political activism together, where you get the image of usually a kind of male monologue, where there is the idea that you have to kind of set aside the urge of romantic love, precious as it is, to do something which is even more important, which is of a different order of love, which involves revolutionary activity. Yeah. Now, when I when we revisit uh, those poems and uh, some of the idioms found in Ningala Neka Munistyaki, uh, there is, I, I read them with a mixture of nostalgia and embarrassment, I would say. And that embarrassment also indicates a secret complicity. You know, that is actually what embarrassment is about. A secret complicity with a desire, which one does not quite understand, which one has not really uh, settled accounts with or brought into the light of day uh, for a serious uh, look or avowal. Right? And, and one of the demands that the book made on people like me was also to put me in touch with this aspect of a kind of affective memorizing, which is part of our own historical conjuncture. Now, uh, the book, Love and Revolution, registers the change which has happened over this period of time between, let's say, the 1970s, which I spoke about, and now, in historical terms. It is a historical experience. The editors tell us in the preface that the Arab Spring had not yet begun at the commencement of these conversations, and it was almost over by the time the, the workshops formally concluded. And this seems to be, in some sense, an image of our present. Insurrections, inspiring repeated insurrections, defeats, victories which are sometimes more tragic than defeats, usurpations of hopes and hopefulness, and the inhabitation of memory through a weak cheerfulness, which is a mark of indifference or resigned gestures of indignation, especially evident in the academy, as its own locus has been rendered visibly insecure and unstable in the recent past. This has enabled, or I might say even compelled, an extension of the affective space that we associate with love. It is as if love in its celebratory and defiant idioms, as for example in the kiss of love protests a few years ago, or in the idioms of romantic political affirmation, have receded, at least for the time being, to reveal a more somber landscape of intensities where love seems to have taken residence in our present. The essays in this volume record this extension of the effect of love with diagnostic precision. Premish Lalu's essay is focused on sadness, and John Soski's on betrayal, and Arinima's on the positive content of disaffection, and Patricia's on the complex emotions of mourning and rage in funeral processions. The book appeared to me an indirect meditation on this extension and its possible meanings. Now, as a student of literature, uh, one habitually, you know, when one confronts a word 
which appears all too familiar, but which ought to be unfamiliar, like love, you look up the history of the word. It's a habit which comes from uh, training in uh, uh, the study of an unfamiliar language. Yeah? Uh, now, in many languages, the words for love seem very old. They are not usually derivatives of other words. They, they really go back. It seems that they go back to uh, the known history of the language, its elementary constituents, so to say. In English, for example, the root from which the word love seems to have developed uh, in Old High German, for instance, also giving rise to words which mean joy, praise, etc. And in many Indian languages, the, the root of the, for the words for love have also to do with delight and also to attachment. Our ordinary language use of the words for love retains this ambient sense of a joyfully intense estimation of the preciousness of the object of our affections. In its modern use, perhaps, or perhaps even in pre-modern use as well, this is also a subjective experience of preciousness, an irrefutable attachment, a point of vulnerability and fragility in the subject. The vocabulary of death and annihilation of the self that is ingrained in the mystical and romantic uses of love, to which Javed Majid refers in his essay on Iqbal and Files, draws on the sense of love as subjective vulnerability in its relationship to the object that it regards as precious. This induces a strange paradox at the heart of our conception of love or the use of the word love, combining steadfastness and also not being willful or sovereign as if one is being commanded rather than commanding. It is to that sense of being commanded that one remains unflinchingly loyal in defiance of all else. This complex and paradoxical configuration of agency in love perhaps accounts for the excess and reiteration of the declaration of love. I love you, a performative utterance that brings into existence a state of love without precedent or history, and also an act of witnessing to something that takes place in one, regardless of one's actions or initiative. The sense of not being in control also pertains to revolution. So this attenuation of agency, which is at the heart of love, also seems to pertain to the concept of revolution. While the etymology of the word revolution refers to a rolling back, it is to the future that the modern idea of the revolution refers to. Paulo Israel says really about that, about the future perfect temporality which is implicit in the idea of the revolution. Yet the words in many languages that stand in for revolution point to disorder and trouble, something unforeseen and wayward, away from the predicted trajectory of preconceived action. Could it be that this waywardness or this awayward movement implicit in love, as well as in the idea of revolution, that really forges the link between these two concepts. I spent some time on these two words because many of the papers in this volume engage in a patient examination of the figures of this attenuation of agency and projected action and locate the emergence of what one may call forms of contemporary political life precisely there. These forms of life occupy moments in a history that spans the conditions of colonialism and post-colonial existence, of forms of memorizing and experience that involve desire and disavowal. In this, there is an attempt to look for new pathways through which one may trace the transmission of affect in the present. Premish's invocation of hordology, 
is important here. A post-colonial aesthetic may offer a new access to sadness, he argues, different from that found in nationalist accounts of failure. Sanal Mohan's work once again involves a new axis, patiently piecing together the traces of an account of the inception of love that dares to present itself as such through its inscription in the family and in discipline. This is also a meditation on the imagination of the threshold of human existence conceived in the figure of the slave by the religious humanist language of Christian missionaries, and then by a Hindu non brahminical reformist imagination, which in Kumaranashan, the poet in Malayalam, generated a monologic poetic apparatus where the slave can wake into humanity through a moment of elementary aesthetic openness and thus become eligible for pedagogy as well as mutuality in love. Pedagogy, uh, interestingly, is at the heart of Siraj Rasul's essay on Tabata, where a new form of frontal public address and pedagogical and mentoring power become important for offsetting collective practices of leadership in favor of what he calls presidentialism. The narrative of Rasul offers uh, a picture which one can imagine because of its focus on this pedagogic apparatus, it has in its surrounding shade the affective forces of transference and counter-transference in the creation of leadership, in the creation of presidentialism, and even in the desire for celebrating certain forms of leaderly power. We are not far away from the theme of betrayal here. Once you come close to this kind of estimation of the leadership, we are also not far from the theme of betrayal. And this is explored powerfully in Soske's discussion of uh, the murder of Do Dr. Abu Bakr Aswit in his paper on the family romance in the time of the revolution. Betrayal of friendship, betrayal of a people, betrayal of the followers. When does the revolution turn saturnine, he asks, devouring its children? Rather than appearing as extrinsic to politics, this possibility appears as an intrinsic possibility, offset in Soske's paper by the love displayed by Aspit and Albertina Sisulu. They are objects of a mourning different from the burial of Aspit, which itself was a betrayal. The Trojan horse, necklacing, and duplicitous slaying of the trusting and the revered, these are the props of a theater where such love blooms and whose entry into politics can take the form of a deep mourning, a grief that enables a disidentification from one's revolutionary heroes and heroines who have been also authors of self-sacrifice. Malerika's and Simona's essays for me in two different ways also engage with the trope of sacrifice. Death remains proximate to the revolutionary, and self-sacrifice unites a gesture of devotion and one of defiance or refusal. Yet the need for the family romance, normative expectations of fidelity and the fear of betrayal are palpable in the afterlife of revolutionary women. Simona's and Arinima's essays bring this volume to our present. The former tracks the demand of uh, the state's demand, you could say, whether it be colonial or post-colonial, that its subjects or citizens produce love. It, it love is commanded. Now, the, the ground of resistance to the colonizer's demand for affection, which Gandhi resisted by invoking the love for one's country, in the post-colonial period, as Arinima shows, becomes the ground of a new demand by the post-colonial state, differentiating between legitimate love and illegitimate love, and where disaffection is seen as the denial of uh, the citizen's duty to love, so to say. So uh, 
even without invoking the people or the country as the alternative pegs for nationalist imagination, there can be a certain defiant love, which we see manifested in displays of disaffection to states, a love which is directed, one may say, at a kind of authenticity and truthfulness, or more simply a refusal of falsehood. This may more often be the expression of an impasse or a crisis rather than a positive account of a commitment which is directed at a palpable object, namely the people or the country. It is not always easy to find a proper ground to articulate this form of refusal. It is increasingly the case that this can be voiced only from an improper place without even the consolation of a future perfect time of the revolution. That seems to be the gesture which increasingly comes up in this defined expression of a positive disaffection as a form of refusal to contemporary states and their demands for love. Simona's insightful diagnostics of present day India of the unavailability of idioms of martyrdom, except through hateful violence, points to the implication of the self, which can only work by demonizing the other and in the act of destroying it uh, by becoming oneself the mirror of this demoniacal other and then sacralizing it as a divine rage. The paper opens up the deep difficulty in thinking the work of hate when it becomes the fragile and therefore self-confident ground of self-esteem and self-love. This is one of the most uh, difficult questions which is raised in the paper. And probably this is something which uh, future conversations may extend forward. Uh, that is the work uh, of work on love and the work on hatred and the indiscernible boundaries between them uh, in the present. For me, the invisible conversation of the papers in the volume, under the signs of love and revolution, revolve around questions of non-sovereignty and politics. This, I think, is the, one of the deeper philosophical questions that the volume poses. Some of the papers in the volume directly engage this, as in Pramesh's discussion, for example, of impotentiality as a feature of a certain kind of sovereignty. You can have a sovereign impotentiality, potentiality manifesting itself as also the potential not to act, which takes the grammar of political agency away from the paradigm of action as we understand it. In some other papers, especially in the affective tenor explored by many of the papers in the volume, there is a preoccupation with forms of non-sovereignty or attenuated sovereignty as the sites of political life of that which uh, uh, forms the kernel of revolutionary politics in our times. Love appears as a place where this attenuation of sovereignty or agency appears as active in its capacity to be affected, its capacity to live on and remember rather than embrace the grammar of something which can be identified as action. This turn is reflected in the genres that the essay is turned. When I say this, I am not referring to recognizable literary forms engaged within the volume, such as poetry, the philosophical statement, or public argumentation. I am more interested in what one, one may call genres of enunciation and recording not only the manifesto, the familiar genre of the revolution, but also the testimony, the personal statement, the missionary report, the petition, the mass labyrinths and scarifications, the biographical forms, both pedagogical and commemorative, as well as documentary recording. These become vital sites of manifesting the placement of subjects in posters that cannot be easily classified as active or passive. What runs through these genres is a power to be affected, a certain permeability that forms the ground 
for attachment and of intense life. As I mentioned earlier, there is a what one may call a middle voice quality about the subject's relationship to action in many of his forms. One speaks here as if one is witnessing something that happens within oneself, but that one has not originated in the form of a purposeful or planned action. Yet this happening also defines one's orientation to the world. A particularly suggestive moment of this uh, is the kind of figuration of agency and orientation found in Patricia's powerful paper on the refusal of light. Those photographs which were not developed, not hidden, but not allowed to enter the domain of viewability and legibility. It is not a secret place that we can access through analysis where these images reside. What is needed is an untimely anachronistic work that would produce a negative. Strangely, a process which is called development, a word that is central to modern ideas of a planned project of progressive temporality. In this wayward turn, away from the agency of making possible seeing and showing, making possible recognition, are we in the presence of the most subtle of figures of love in a political sense, which takes the burden of political life fully without flinching? If love and revolution brings these thoughts to us, it is on, on account of the way it captures as if in a diagram, the forces that orient affect in politics, life in its permeability and connectedness in our present. Its historical studies are prompted by this diagram, which perhaps can be isolated only in our present under conditions of difficulty in accessing the very concepts of love and revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Devana. Uh, Professor Salim, may I request you to take the discussion further? Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you're audible. Yeah, thank you, uh, KCHR. Uh, Professor Tarragon and Professor Arunima for uh, giving me this opportunity to be part of uh, celebrating a book uh, edited by three uh, friends. Uh, I had an opportunity to be, uh, you know, sort of part of it in a marginal way as a discussant in some of the, uh, the, the seminars, uh, the workshop, which formative workshops. And also some of our, uh, you know, winter schools, uh, uh, you know, where, where uh, I got a chance to see the kind of intellectual rigor, sophistication, and also political commitment, which is uh, part of uh, this. So it's also, you know, a great occasion to see Pramesh and Patricia. Actually, I have seen them against great table mountain and oceans and to see them against this plain screen is so sad. Uh, so in fact, uh, you know, in fact, I wanted to start by saying that usually, you know, we read a lot of books and our general approach to books is that whenever we buy or download a book, we will say that, look, we will read it another time. But we live in a time where we may not have such you know, another time. So it's become very precarious because I am in Calcutta now on sabbatical, uh, hoping to work uh, at the National Library. But the National Library doesn't allow me to enter because I am not vaccinated. And so now our access to books and intellectual resources are all going to be uh, controlled, determined by various things. So when you get a book in whatever form, I think we need to hold on to it and uh, celebrated with some, uh, you know, excitement. 
So in fact, uh, the book uh, has a great uh, introduction. And after that introduction and uh, uh, Uday's uh, nuanced engagement with it, I think uh, nothing much need to be uh, said. And that you know gives me a kind of rather careless space to speak, share my excitement about reading this uh, book. And as Uday and Pramesh uh, already said, this is, you know, the kind of the background was something about the anti-colonial na nationalism and its engagement with colonial modernity and the anti-colonial nationalism and its engagement with globalization. And these produce a certain sadness, disaffection, fatigue, outlook, outlawed emotions, and also a certain passive aggression. Right. So this book is, I think, uh, 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 one important theme of the book is this uh, sadness, disaffection, fatigue. In fact, some of the most joyful and humorous and general academics I know have come together to write a book on all these sad and negative passions. So that makes it, uh, you know, shows us the urgency and the seriousness of uh, that uh, project. Um, and you know the uh, we know there is a certain way in which we can engage with this conjunction uh, love and revolution because uh, we know that love is often supposed to create a very revolutionary situation. In fact, in uh, you know in the 1980s during the time of uh, Nexal Bari inspired revolutionary movements in Kerala, there was a very famous uh, popular graffiti from the Chilean poet Nicanor Para. Uh, we said when two people kiss the world changes right so uh, uh, that is the kind of excitement in which some commonsensical way love and the sense of revolution was connected and revolution also was supposed to have love as a kind of affective ethical moment because all of our descriptions about revolution says it's culminating in uh, uh, you know totalitarianism and violence, and uh, this is supposed to be a certain uh, pedagogy of humanism and affect, which is supposed to be part of this. And this is the whole conversation about reason and emotion and how uh, you know, a scientific rational revolution is not adequate. We need to have an affective component to this. So this is the kind of popular uh, way in which uh, we talk about it. And I think this popular conversation, I think we have to, immediately pitch it against a statement from Che Guevara. Che Guevara said, hate is the revolutionary statement, sentiment. Hate is the revolutionary sentiment. Now, we don't know whether he really said it because I have not seen any, this is quoted in any book, but you know, you look around the graffitis, both the people who love and hate, uh, Che Guevara quotes this statement that hate is the revolutionary uh, sentiment. Uh, so, uh, how do you understand this relation between uh, love and hate, love and revolution, given this idea about uh, hate could be a revolutionary sentiment? In fact, uh, if you really look at the, uh, you know, Indian classical tradition and literature, uh, hate actually is a more effective route to salvation and liberation and being one with God than um, love. Right, and Vishnu Purana says, like Samarambha Bhayena Yoga. That is uh, Samarambha Bhayena Yoga. That is hate and fear, its combination is the quickest route to salvation. So, you know, to give you a, a quick story about it, uh, you know, the, the guardians of the Vishnu Loka, they were cursed by uh, a sage that they will be born as human beings uh, on earth. And uh, so they, as usual, when there is a curse, there is always a boon. So finally they were told that they can come back to the heaven, but they have to, you know, couple of births they have to take as human beings. So they, they were given a choice. If they love God, they will take nine lives in order to come back to the heaven. But if they hate God intensely, they will come back in three months, three births and they will actually uh, you know take it and you know first he was born as hiranyakashipu uh, at the saw of the king but he will hate god only if somebody else praise god in front of him 
So it was intermittent hatred. Then he is born as Ravana, and he fought with the god Rama. But his hatred for the god was distracted by his love for Sita. So it's only when he is born as Shishupala that he, even as a baby, his baby talk was cursed for the god. So the absolute intensity of hatred actually allows him a quick, uh, you know, uh, deliverance. So this, as they also said, that uh, one of the challenges which this book is asking us to do is, is to think about this trajectory between, uh, you know, hate and love. What are the operation imminent to hate, which can release it to connect it to questions about, uh, you know, uh, freedom. And the one thing which hate often does is that, you know, hate actually is, as we say, it is uh, entity directed emotion that it always want to direct, it's directed at an entity and it wants to rebuild the world without that entity. And it also breaks with the circle of uh, revenge. And the classical figure of this hatred will be the Greek, uh, you know, media. Media actually, she had a, you know, a revenge with her husband that is broken by hating her own children and killing them. So you have the figure of a mother who hated and murdered their children. And that is what which shows. And, you know, there are various renditions of this tragedy. So Pasolini's famous film end with media raging and declaring that nothing is possible. And that's the political statement of hatred, that nothing is possible, right? And this is the question about impotentiality, disaffection, uh, you know, as Arunima develops and uh, the question of sadness, fatigue, you know, how do we really encounter this rage? It's not a passivity, it is not acceptance of uh, defeat. Somebody raging, a mother who killed her children rages and says, nothing is possible. Is there a politics which can, you know, come out of uh, this? This is the question, uh, you know, this uh, thing form. And now in our political climate, it's very difficult to pose this question because it's all, you know, for example, in India, the nationalist dream was immediately, you know, it was also parallel with the hatred for, uh, you know, Muslims. And, uh, you know, all these talk about, uh, you know, for example, in India today, you can't talk about anything called Islamic uh, vandalism because you will say, look, oh, they were not really vandalism. They were actually all kings, kings looted uh, various temples, Hindu kings also looted temples. But you go to some of these temples, so, you know, the we are underestimating the humanity of a destroyer of icons. When you place the stand in front of these great idols, Right? Destroying them has to be a very, very emotional, affective, spiritual encounter. They are not like the demolition squad of municipality, which goes around and destroying all kinds of illegal buildings. There is a straight encounter. For example, the way uh, the Taliban destroyed uh, uh, the uh, Bami and Buddhas, they came to power in 96 and they demolished it only at 2001. And they waited with them, made several approaches to it and finally, you know, destroys it. And today they have a 3D hologram of the destroyed Buddhas they have constructed, right? So what went through these kinds of destructions and what is the affective uh, world and processes of uh, this? I think this uh, book actually for invites me to, you know, ask this rather brutal, uh, you know, questions. And, uh, you know, when we read the book, what, uh, you know, one has to, why are we not today talking about love and revolution? And here my, you know, proposal is that we don't want to talk about love because we really want to talk about his friendship, right? And all our descriptions of love today is one of friendship because the way we look at politics, look at democracy, everything is based on the idea about uh, you know, friendship. Montaigne somewhere says that love is the quest for friendship with a beautiful object, right? And this idea about friendship has something to do with, uh, you know, the, the nature of democracy, which uh, we have. The idea about philia in the Greek society, where it is a certain relationship between friendship and rivalry, right? And they have all these, you know, all the funeral games, et cetera, all these rewards are kept in public, in the open, and everybody can contest for uh, this. 
And another aspect of this Greek idea about friendship is the idea about autochthony, right? The idea that the Greek men, the citizen, male citizen is born not from a sexual union, right? They are born from the earth. Men are born from the earth. The Greek becomes Athenians only after they are born without a man-woman uh, you know, uh, relationship. And this philia and this autochthony allows them to have a certain relationship which is based on dealing with opinions. That's what the Greeks said. They had a taste for uh, you know, opinions. And so uh, this is the paradigm in which the affective universe of our discussion is, you, know, you have to respect the other and love is nothing but respect for your you know, partner, et cetera. But uh, if you really ask the question, what is the difference between love and uh, friendship in our popular uh, discussion is that, you know, we know that, you know, when we are just friends means there is no sexual relationship. So do you think that then, uh, you know, friendship with sex, is it love? No, this is where we need to quickly attend to, uh, you know, Lacan's famous statement that the real truth of love is that there is no such thing as a sexual relationship, right? Sex sexuality is not a matter of, uh, you know, relationship at all. And uh, 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 the idea about sexuality is that uh, it is in fact, love is something which encounters the truth that there is sexuality is not a relationship. Friendship is something which refuses to face this. That is why it is not a problem. It's not like, you know, there is an intensity to love which friendship lacks. In fact, friendship is the most intense thing because it doesn't have to encounter any lack of relationship or any lack of meanings in the, uh, you know, order of uh, uh, these things, right? And uh, so in fact, uh, Javed, Mia, uh, Javed uh, Majid's uh, first paper actually encountered it straight by starting the discussion with uh, the Iqbal's poetry. As you know that Iqbal is somebody who demanded, uh, you know, separation of uh, uh, Muslims in India during the freedom movement. And also he was somebody who was very critical of Sufism, which gives the paradigm for all communal love, harmony, et cetera. Today, he was somebody who privileged, uh, you know, Aurangzeb over Dara Shikov. And for him, the essential insight was that the idea about love has nothing to do with relationship, right? The idea about Sufi love was this kind of mystical union with the God. He said, look, love has to something with it that the kudi or the individual self. Love means a kind of maximalist expansion of the finite self in which it, you know, one can actually, there is an absolute affirmation of the finite self and hence love is something which individualizes and actually which separates uh, one and God and one and everybody else, et cetera. And he actually tracks down the philosophical heritage uh, of this non-relational notion about uh, love by looking at uh, the early Hegelians like Maktadar. And it's very interesting that, uh, you know, the, there, there was a contemporary uh, Indian Hegelian, Hiralal Haldar, and all the people like Iqbal uh, and Haldar, who are all non-colonial Hegelians, were telling the West that don't give up on Hegel. Don't give up on the question about the absolute. Don't jump into questions about self, other, communicative relationship. There is a certain way of affirming the absolute is possible internal to the question about love. And this is a you know, legacy of that uh, you know, anti-colonial thing, philosophical tradition, we need to, uh, you know, really uh, recover. So, you know, so the talk about, uh, we don't talk about love or we very careful about love because we really want to talk about is friendship. And we, we want to talk about friendship because that's the most comfortable relationship with the question about uh, sexuality. Now, why do we uh, want to talk about revolution? It is because what we want to talk about today is about protest, right? And not about revolution. And there is a, all kinds of criticisms of the idea about revolution because you know revolution is something which is part of a grand narrative which actually invokes 
uh, it is driven by some science of history it is driven by teleological concept of time and there is no single contradiction and there is no uh, global you know universal subject like working class etc but my proposal is that we don't want to talk about revolution because we don't want to accept that the fundamental level of politics is civil war right and civil war is the fundamental state of uh, politics and that is why we actually encounter to the political uh, field today riots, uh, you know, partisan uh, fights, mafia takeovers. That's where actual politics is really fought, right? And uh, we define politics in contemporary times as the absence of civil war. Now, this is a very shocking insight which uh, Foucault. Uh, you know, uh, discusses in his 1972-73 uh, lectures, where we generally confuse the question about the fear of the civil war uh, is, and to want to talk about all kinds of marginal, plural, protest struggles, etc., comes from the confusion between civil war with the Hobbesian idea of uh, all against all war, where, where the individuals are warring, and finally, that uh, a sovereign will come up and this war will be, uh, you know, try with this warring situation, which is not political, which is a natural situation, will be converted into politics when the sovereign comes and ends this history about war. So any civil war is an eruption of the natural into the domain of, uh, you know, politics. And another figure, which is of the notion of war, which is Karl Schmidt idea about politics as between the struggle between friend and enemy. And in uh, Carl Schmitt, you find towards the end of his you know, philosophical career, he proposes the idea about a partisan warrior. A partisan is, you know, Sheguera will be a classical partisan fighter who is irregular, who is highly mobile, highly intensely politi politicized, and he is telluric in the sense of he has a certain terrain, either they fight in the forest or they fight in the mountains. Right, it's very much tied to the questions about a certain geological, geographical, uh, you know, situation. So, you know, this this peculiar way of defining, uh, you know, politics as the absence of civil war refuses his access to the question about the reality of riots, the reality of, uh, you know, civil war. And at the heart of it, what re we really don't want to face is the question about the dictatorship of the proletariat. That is the question about communism or the question about revolution races is that there is a moment of the dictatorship of the proletariat, whether there is a partisan affirmation of the uh, of uh, sovereignty, which actually will lead to the uh, withering away of the state. So, uh, you know, the, we don't want to talk about rebel, uh, love because we want to talk about friendship and want to avoid the impossibility, the senses, senselessness of sexuality and we don't want to talk about revolution because we really want we are we are scared about the question about civil war and so this is the formidable you know impossibility against which this book is proposing itself and you know in fact really look at the methodological principle which organizes this again in 1972 uh, foucault uh, offers us you know foucault rejects two of his methodological principles, which are so popular among social scientists, right? He himself started that, but one is that the question about exclusion. He says, you cannot access this level of politics if you look at your critical in terms of somebody is excluded from certain whole, right? So he said, I myself thought about writing about people who are, you know, marginalized, exclusion itself. I know that's not a methodological tool. Another one is to think about, uh, you know, criticality as transgression, transgression of rules, transgression of limit, et cetera. So these two popular, our critical tools, which is uh, of one is looking for political domain, political subjectivity, where something is excluded and thinking about political subjectivity as one of transgression, right? And it's very, you know, it is very fascinating to watch as Foucault who proposed this withdraws these things. He said, look, I have done it, I have already, there are two generalized tools. And if you really look at the struggle with these papers in this book does is 
they are trying to articulate a certain domain of affective politics without these popular tools of looking for exclusions and looking for uh, you know, transgressions. Uh, and as uh, uh, Uday pointed out that uh, this book actually tracks down, sets the question about a history of emotions and asks the question about what is an archive of affect? What is the challenge for looking at and what is our emotional you know, present? Can we think about our emotional present without succumbing to any kind of utopia or any kind of uh, you know, uh, nostalgia? Assuming that emotion is already thinking, right? In affective state, we are already thinking. So what is the kind of transformation from hate to love, right? From sadness to joy, how do we really think about uh, this? And what is the difficulty of writing, creating an archive of uh, affect is that we often think that if there are feelings, there has to be feelers, right? If there is sad, sadness in the world, that means there is somebody who is sad. And we need to actually track these subjects who are actually sad. And that is the whole idea about Western philosophy, the idea of auto-affection. We have affects because we actually affect ourselves. And we also know how it is criticized by a lot of studies on shame, humiliation, et cetera, that it is not auto-affection, but it is hetero-affection. We need to really think about uh, an intersubjective situation between self and the other in order to come up with an uh, archive of the affect. But this is where, you know, uh, many places and also, uh, you know, Aronima's uh, paper forces the question about disaffection. Now, disaffection is not another affection. It is in the domain of the affective uh, world, but it's not another affection, right? So how do we really track the question about disaffection? So it's not the question of affection being personal or interpersonal, but affects are impersonal. How do you track the impersonal emotions. What are the cartographies which allows you to, uh, you know, do this? And you know, in today's level, I think the one of the most predominant emotion today is one of fe fear. And we know that it's not like you know many psychological studies have now shown that we are all sticking to COVID-appropriate behavior, not because we are really concerned about other people or we are scared about our own life. It is a behavioral regularity which we inhabit, and then we learn to cultivate fear. Like that's why it is fun to be scared today under the COVID regime, because you have a lot of, uh, you know, choreographed moments which you can actually feel scared. So in the fifties, there was this famous advertisement by Coca-Cola, which said it is fun to be thirsty. And today we can say that it is fun to be scared, right? And uh, so it is this idea about an impersonal archive is what they are, uh, you know, uh, looking for. And uh, in fact, uh, this, this idea about disaffection is what Pramesh calls the long winter of post-colonial, post apartheid uh, you know, sadness. Now here, you know, this is, this is not a mere lefted feeling, but this is also the uh, feeling which is articulated by some of the rigorous right-wing thinkers, for example, Julius Evola, who is also a friend of Mussolini, he actually called, he also recognized the contemporary situation as one of disaffection. And he called it that uh, the, this is the period of interregnum, or he actually bought, you know, takes a concept from the Indian mythology and said, this is Kali Kalam, right? This period of disaffection. And he actually says that it's not the time for politics, just indulge in petty illegalism. That's what we need to, uh, you know, uh, do. Riots are our only uh, political uh, possibility. So, uh, you know, the anti-colonial national struggle incited one's love for the country, uh, but the post-independence time, these nationalisms have turned totally ugly and uh, Saranima shows they are actually generating the, the legal means, juridical means in order to incite some kind of, you know, intervene in this uh, disaffection. Uh, and this peculiar disaffection is the time where, as Pramesh says, that the nationalist, what is the wounded paternity of the nationalist, is trying to manufacture a desire by overloading the subaltern. 
right? There's a, so much of expectation is on the subaltern so that it will give a certain desire to the wounded paternity of the Ayadi, uh, you know, uh, nationalist, right? And uh, that is why we need to really look at this question about, uh, you know, how do we place this fatigue, sadness, you know, in the imagination of uh, love, you know, where there is a disaffection, which is not one of mourning or one of uh, melancholy. Uh, and also like it is, how is this uh, nationalism is mobilizing this sadness for nihilistic biopolitical, uh, you know, ends. So what with the political claim, which some of these articles proposes is to say that nationalism has no monopoly on this sadness, subaltern sadness, right? It is to make a claim on this, uh, you know, uh, you know, sadness. Uh, that is the uh, possibility this, uh, uh, some of, you know, the papers are actually, and uh, this is where the question about the hodological space uh, you know, comes in. You know, as Sartre says that, you know, what are emotions? Emotions are actually actions in fainting, right? It is running while fainting. That, you know, I see a snake suddenly in this room and I know it is threatening to my life. I should just rationally think about it and just move out or kill the snake. But why is this thing called, uh, you know, um, fear comes in? It is because suddenly the face transform is no longer the face of causal reaction of human instrumental action, but uh, all kinds of pathways by which the snake can in one, like a lightning can land on my neck, right? And it is this sudden transformation of the space, this autological space is where, uh, you know, where this affection really uh, happens. And uh, this, uh, you know, place has on the one hand, it's a magical space where causal reactions are suspended. On the other hand, it is also a place of liberation because all kinds of pathways are uh, opened up. And what we can actually do is internal to the stasis, can we open up this hordological space? Now in, in, in Kerala, uh, you know, in Malayalam literature, we have Uday's work where he actually opened up uh, poetics of this hordological work in his reading of uh, C.I. Yepin's, uh, you know, um, uh, short story. And uh, that is, you know, where, you know, where the possessive speech and, uh, you know, where, how does this new pathways where causal things are suspended, uh, you know, where uh, can be opened up. And re the real challenge there is that how can you mourn? You know, sadness means there is mourning, but you, you have to mourn without getting, uh, you know, mourned. And, you know, we are living in a peculiar situation where, uh, you know, in the uh, last few years, everybody start their conversation by saying that, uh, you know, so many, of, so many of our dear people have died during this last two years, but just ask people how many funerals they attended and they have not attended. It's a peculiar time where so many of our dear people are dying when we, nobody ever goes for any, uh, you know, funerals. And, you know, that's why it was, you know, one could read Patricia's uh, paper with only this kind of, you know, anxiety about the contemporary, uh, you know, times where, you know, there is an archive of this question about the uh, affective archive, the question about the hodological space. She takes it up as the question about the stillborn photographs of the dead, right? All these funeral photographs where, which are not really developed. Now, you know, usually our worry about the archive is already that some somebody's things are not, some people are excluded from the uh, archive. The archive should have been maximal, but some external constraints have reduced it. But, uh, you know, uh, Patricia says, no, actually these, these archives are actually already very poor archive because this is not developed. And even when the historian develops them, they are really bad photographs, right? And uh, so there are, you know, in fact, she actually, you know, set up this peculiar photographic situation where there's a funeral without the dead body in the coffin. And there is a photographer's shadow which conceals the object. And people are crying, there are tears in the hand, but that's because of the tear gas, which is there in the site of the 
uh, you know, the photograph, right? So there is a certain way in which we can think about this affective archives, not in terms of the final photograph, fully enunciated statements, but at the level of these kinds of undeveloped, uh, you know, uh, uh, photographs, which are full of excess uh, light and dust, uh, right? So it's what, this is something like the, Foucault talked about the murmur of the uh, archive, not the clear, uh, you know, uh, speech. And this, this, this question about the death is, uh, you know, taken to it as some kind of impossible limits by uh, some of the papers, you know, like Simona's paper on the question about Bhagat Singh and uh, sac sacrifice. You know, today we know that uh, AAP finally has said uh, in, in, in Punjab, there are only two photographs will be displayed in government offices, uh, which is uh, Bhagat Singh and Ambedkar. In fact, this paper, you know, almost have the great premonition about the situation under which we are doing something like this. So, you know, in fact, that paper actually tracks down, you know, the whole scene of sacrifice through polarities like devotion and defiance, general, may masculine, uh, you know, defiance and feminine sacrifice, generosity and destruction, capital, capital punishment and sacrifice, the ethical and the political, all these dualities, actually, Simona tracks down something about the, 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 the sacrifice, which is a moment of actual death, right? What is the death? That, that is the zero point of a sacrifice. How do we take up this question? That is what all the contemporary celebration of his, uh, you know, uh, matridum for violent thing doesn't assert the fact that often all of our discussions about sacrifice say that all sacrifice is self-sacrifice. But Simona gives us a space to say that no, all self-sacrifice is actually a sacrifice. And as you know, you know, our mothers want to sacrifice everything except that sacrifice itself, right? So what is there in that unsacrificable you know, sacrifice. And that is the moment of real cruelty, right? That's, there is a death and there is a cruelty. What is this cruelty is cruelty for which there is nothing in the domain of pity can respond to, right? There is something in the suffering which pity cannot attend to, right? That is the pure moment of instrumentality, death and, you know, cruelty. You know, in uh, Indian languages like Malayalam, the matter is called recta sakshi. Right here, for him, the only witness is his its own blood, right? And this is this moment of uh, you know witnessing is something which uh, you know very important for. In fact, I was thinking that what is it in about Gandhi that we will pitch against this moment of sacrifice? I could only think about Gandhi's criticism of uh, vaccination. You know that Gandhi refused to take. Uh, you know, vaccine and also refused to give vaccine to uh, his uh, children because he felt that, look, only truth can be contagious, right? And science's idea about this contagion in terms of, you know, you know we need this, uh, you know, picture story where round looking viruses move from one to other, which you know that at the level of sort of scientific, rigorous scientific description, there are no such uh, causalities work. And it has so also universal compulsive nature and hence, Gandhi actually offered his death. This is when Gandhi refused to vaccinate, it is not martyrdom, it is not sacrifice. He's simply signing up to die and also be the potential cause of a death. It's not suicide, right? It is this, this, this peculiar notion about this death, right? Where the victim who is suffering is an ultimate notion of numbness, which people like Simone Weil try to uh, bring out, right? And uh, I will just uh, quickly end in two minutes by, for me, all these papers where I was reading it as a preparation to get the courage to read Sanal Mohan's paper, which is the most closest to us, for us in India, in, uh, you know, uh, Kerala, the question about, uh, uh, you know, uh, slave caste and another historian, contemporary historian, Dinesh and Vadakinil, recently called this as a development of a counter archive. Right. That's where it talks to many other papers in this volume. Now, this question about slave caste, you know, one way to read it is, in my way, uh, unkind way of reading it is, but suddenly we discover that there was slavery in, uh, you know, in Kerala. 
And I think that is what Sanal Mohan is saying is something more, far more uh, dangerous and serious than uh, you know that. Because when you know Sharada Mani, uh, you know Anu's mother posed this question about the absence of uh, slave uh, archives, she was not merely saying that that Brahmins didn't write it or there are no popular sentiments, etc. But the real problem was that there are no slaves, right? There were maybe there was. Uh, slavery, but there were no slaves. And only at some particular juncture with the missionaries coming that something called slave, slaves actually occurs, right? And that is why it's an ontologically light notion, but very potential, uh, you know, uh, notion. And this allows us to now to talk about, for example, a Dalit subjectivity, which as Pramesh is diagnosing is the nationalist is actually overloading in order to you know, inside some important desires of emancipation, he shifts that whole talk into the question about something called, uh, you know, slave caste. This movie is parallel to what Ambedkar did in 19, you know, in his essay on the uh, caste in India, where he said, look, caste is actually caste, as we talk about, is actually a creation of 1911 uh, census. Right? Caste is not a structure, it's not a system, it is not a strategy. It is a whole set of social processes which has actually gone chaotic. Right? So hence it is ontologically a very light concept. So in, in that sense, locating a precise moment of the birth of the slave. And the unfortunate thing that people might go back and get into a positivist discussion, oh, there was actually economic descriptions about slavery in India. Nobody has noticed it. So that there could be a positivism of slavery coming by other literature. But that's not the uh, point which uh, he is actually uh, making. And this takes up to the, uh, you know, my last point about what exactly is the proposal for love which the Ambedkar was proposing. The real notion about love is a love for truth. In fact, he says that what happened, he makes a distinction between, uh, you know, uh, uh, between um, philosophy and religion. He said in India, there was a lot of philosophy, a lot of serious cognitive act, you know, activity. The lot of truth was generated in India, but Indians never loved the truth. Now, truth always so affectively charged that if you don't love it, then it actually produces hatred. And he actually tracks caste hatred in India, not to any Brahmin strategies, but the absence of love for truth in, uh, you know, uh, India. And we can say that maybe it is, you know, this unnatural category of truth again reappears in the South African, uh, you know, context, uh, true. Right. So the question about uh, the love has to be fundamentally posed as a question about, uh, you know, uh, truth. And then we ask the question, okay, now we talked about the question, you know, I said the, the there is a absence of relationality in, in love. And there is the question about civil war and riot and the question about politics. So how do we transform? What is our idea about transforming this hatred, negative emotions, disaffection into something called the love, which is always under the ages of truth. Now, uh, one way, the Western philosophies, political philosophies answer is that hate can transform into love only when it is in contact with an idea. And what is that idea? Some people say it's the idea of justice. Some people will say it is the idea about uh, freedom. And people like Alan Badiou says it is the idea about communism. But it is time that we really ask the question, what is the genealogy of this idea idea? And idea idea is, again, that came out of questions about friendship, philia, questions about octatony, questions about uh, opinion, doxa, in the peculiar configuration of the Western Greek configuration about uh, democracy, right? And there has to be a way of thinking about this connection without cutting it this idea what exactly what are there outside how does other traditions really think is idea or concept is the only way in which traditions can think so that you can come about a transformation from uh, you know uh, the question about hatred negative to the questions about joy and liberation and here i think 
there are other traditions which thought using figures using architectures and uh, using idols using demolitions and uh, that is for me the question about religion for me religion is not a question about spirituality or god or anything it is the question about ram mandir it is the question about babri demolition it is the question about bami and buddhas and all these other choreographies and masks which has created with this is the, for me is the fascination for uh, Pablo Israel's paper about, about choreography and mass. That is where the question about religion, which is in, 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 in when Pramesh talked about another iteration of this, perhaps I think a point which these reflection can proceed to take is the really the question about religion. Thank you. I've really overshot my allotted time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Sami. Um, so before we move to the contributors' comments, I would like to remind you all that you can type in your uh, queries or responses to the chat box. Um, now I invite Professor Paulo Israel to speak. Um, hello and good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, first, just a word of thanks for having been invited to this virtual platform. Um, and it's very nice to see everybody. Um, and also very nice to be back in the kind of in the space of love and revolution after after so, so many years. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to say a few words about uh, some of my perceptions um, of the workshop and the book that it generated. And then just a few words about my own chapter and the ways in which it spoke to some of the themes. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so the first thing is to say is that, I mean, and it has been mentioned already, but I think it's, um, it's worth saying it again, uh, is that um, there was something about the experience of those workshops. Uh, and for my part, I think I, I, I took part only in one of the four, but there was some kind of intellectual exhilaration and the sense of surprise, uh, novelty and excitement about, you know, the, 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 those, um, those encounters, which I hope are reflected in the volumes. Um, and I think there was, in the in the in this coupling of love and revolution, there was um, both a sense of um, I would almost want to say a puzzleness that you know they came together in an in an experimental way, um, uh, and uh, you know moving from the from the. Uh, uh, war in the everyday to another to this idea of having two big themes that collide and seeing what comes what comes out of it. So I think there was some sense of freshness and of experimentalism in the ways in which. And then on the other hand, um, it was also quite a well trodden crossroads where we located um, us. I mean, love and revolution. I remember. Uh, in the time of the workshop, stumbling on a bar in Johannesburg, which, which was called the, the Revolution. I mean, so it's, it's a kind of well-known and in, in intersection. But I think that in um, dealing with it from the perspective of the South, I think we destabilized some of the coordinates um, from which that intersection had been apprehended quite in important ways. Um, because my sense is that, um, and, and especially the, the, the love side, I think, was destabilized more. So when we read and we began to think about um, this coupling, uh, there was a sense in which re re revolution translated very di di directly in some of the historical settings that we were, we were dealing with. And I'm going to speak about <clears throat> the one that my paper deals with especially. Um, so that we, one could trace revolution very immediately uh, in, you know, um, uh, in the Southern African and South Asian context. But then that love, as it has been mentioned, uh, um, as Daya as, as, as mentioned, didn't map as well. There was more complexity when one tried to map love 
um, in a straightforward way. And the coupling of love and revolution, I mean, there was a sense of bourgeois mor morality of the revolution. There was a sense of a platonic legacy of love as truth. Um, and there was, of course, a sense of uh, Christian Pauline love, which is a sense in sort of the almost the classic Stalinist and post-Stalinist coupling of love and revolution. And I think that, um, yeah, love in our various interventions didn't map um, in such a uh, straightforward ways. And there were very different iterations of love and that destabilized also the uh, concept of revolution we were working with. So yeah, just a few words about my own chapter and how does it uh, speak to the to the volume or to the themes in the volume. So uh, my chapter was is located. I mean, as it had, as it has been mentioned, one of the um, core um, um, angles, you know, in which the volume um, operates is the intersection between the affective and aesthetics. So my chapter is lo lo located there, and um, it comes out of a of a work that sort of it's the PhD work that then was turned into a book, and so it was a chapter that went in a way beyond the book. So what's the story? The story it's a chapter that is written in a, in a, in a narrative mode, um, and it's the story of a masquerading tra tradition from northern Mozambique and its encounter with. The revolution. So we have a very um, concrete example of a revolutionary history. This is the heartland of the Mozambican revolution, and then um, it's a it's an attempt of tracing affect from the angle of aesthetics from through through the masks. Um, uh, and so the core question. It asks, I mean, because in a sense, there was an interpolation from above for these masks to be read um, as, uh, as an expression of collective love towards the party, the, the revolution and the leader. And so the key question that the, uh, that the chapter asks and that it tries to answer again through narrative is uh, to what extent did that happen? And really the chapter attempts to locate moments of disconnection, or rather it does two things. On the one hand, uh, it tries to, to demarcate the outline of that, of the, of, of that interpolation. Uh, so of what um, this affective interpolation from, um, from the re 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 revolution look like, you know, what the re re revolution expected a, um, a peasant aesthetics to look like. And so here we have, um, uh, the, uh, the idea of a people, certain ideas of class, of the peasantry having to re represent itself in its activities. Um, of course, a cathetic re relationship between the people and the leader and the enemy um, looming large um, uh, at the heart of these aesthetics, um, you know, thinking about hate. There is definitely that sense of hate at the heart of the re revolutionary aesthetic. So the chapter outlines this cathetic in interpolation on the one hand, and on the other hand, it outlines the contours of a resistance of sorts, of the ways in which the interpolation is deflected, delayed, and played with in the actual history um, and the practice of this tradition of masquerading. Um, so uh, to use Udaya's terms, in a sense, it's a, it's a history of, um, of, an, of an attenuated sovereignty. So where you have this very powerful re re revolutionary sovereignty trying to impose its script, um, then you have forms of fragmented and attenuated so sovereignties in the practice of these masks and in the social worlds that they refer to. Um, and uh, Mapico, these masquerades are uh, one of those social institutions which re referring to James Scott, one might call kind of pro producing a subjectivity that is against the state or trying to working in a different uh, direction of what the, what the state imposes. Um, so the chapter highlights these moments of 
um, the history of the masks being out of sync with what um, is, is expected, histories of playfulness, um, of competition, of smaller identities than the greater uh, re revolutionary uh, identity. There is also love in songs, um, and it's a different kind of love that the great revolutionary love. Uh, there is cosmopolitan love, uh, there are body jests, and there are kind of mischievous love, so all those kind of other registers. Um, and just again to pick up about the question of the, you know the etymology of the word love and of the word love and this is a discussion we had in reading groups before is that in a way it, it doesn't um, in at least in in the context where I work with but I think it's a theme that had emerged across uh, you know spaces is that it, it, it doesn't map and, and for instance in my case in a sense the language. Uh, is more in, is more inclined to a Deleuzean configuration. There, there is desire be, for love. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, just to wrap it up and not to speak too too much. I think my contribution was, in a sense, a contribution in, on a minor note. Um, um, it's um, it's a contribution around issues of re revolution, play. Um, aesthetics and it's located at the heart in a place that it's at the core of the question, but also um, exploring some side paths. Um, and then just a final word to say uh, that, I mean, uh, sadness has been evoked as a, uh, uh, as a structure of feelings several times. Uh, and so the, the, the recent history of this place I've written about is that as some people might be aware of, it has be, sort of become one of the, um, uh, the place where a, a, a major Islamist um, uh, insurgency has exploded in the past four years. So all this history of re revolution in a, in a light and minor mode that has become much more tragic um, in the past years, and um, and so some other kind of dark sides have emerged in a great overturning, actually, of what the sensibility was there. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much again for inviting me and for being part of this conversation. I've learned a lot from listening to the people who have been for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rachel. <clears throat> I'm extremely uh, glad to be part of the conversation, and uh, I'm grateful to the chairman, Kerala Council of Historical Research, Professor Michael Saragan, editors of the book, uh, Love and Revolution. Arunima, Professor Arunima, Professor Patricia is from S level, and uh, other speakers, friends, right? Uday Kumar, Sanil, and other friends who are uh, part of this conversation. <clears throat> uh, it is indeed a wonderful time to uh, really learn from. Uh, the critiques presented by uh, the uh, formidable academics who had been doing research in these areas of uh, critical social sciences. And uh, my, that has given me a lot of insights and also to uh, place myself in uh, this conversation as well as uh, some of the ideas that I uh, currently work on. Now, uh, we have already seen how rich this uh, book is and how much uh, fascinating uh, those four workshops had been. And I was part of this uh, daily workshop and I still recall uh, the, the conversation that we had then. Uh, while we had presented our papers at uh, Tin Muti and also the conversation we had 
on the sidelines of the seminar, etc., which actually uh, gave a lot of things to really uh, work through. And the ways in which uh, my paper subsequently evolved, actually, it was uh, it drew quite uh, quite heavily from the conversations uh, that followed. Now, uh, as it was uh, pointed out by uh, the uh, discussants earlier, so one of the things that I mean, uh, the, among the many things that have been talked about and some of those I'm sure we will, in our own way, carry on in our uh, researches and discussions. Uh, one of those questions have been the question of affect. And then uh, as someone who works uh, with the uh, historical kind of materials, I, so one of my problems then and now, uh, as I think about it is to write about, uh, the manner in which, for example, emotions have been articulated uh, through uh, the structure of the family or individual relations and so on, and uh, the possibilities of uh, really, uh, you know, looking at this from a historical perspective. That was one of the questions that I took up. And then uh, looking at this, as after I read the introduction of the book uh, by Arunima, Patricia and Pramesh, and also going back to uh, the late 90s uh, presentations, one of the presentations of Patricia, which I had the fortune to listen to, this uh, about photography in the Namibian context, national liberation context. Uh, so the questions of emotions, uh, you know, uh, got articulated in a very powerful way in those representations. Then uh, connecting this, uh, uh, certain ways of, uh, you know, uh, carrying over those insights and looking at uh, the kind of uh, questions that I wanted to work uh, in the context of Kerala. And I found that uh, as uh, Sanil has already pointed out. So the, what, how much was the possibility of exploring this particular archive of uh, emotions, affect, et cetera, uh, in the context of Kerala. And of course, I know that this is something unique. So we do have, uh, I have some familiarity with that in its, of its globality. And I'm sure that many other researchers from other parts of the world uh, who are part of this conversation, uh, you know, definitely know it uh, very well that this is something which has been very new and articulated differently. So therefore, uh, how these, uh, you know, uh, new subjectivities in, uh, in certain ways, uh, you know, uh, transfigured uh, the people involved in uh, articulating this. This was one of the questions that I thought uh, as a very significant uh, problem uh, to be taken up. And uh, so my interaction uh, in the Delhi conference, Delhi workshop, and subsequent communication with the editors as well as uh, the readers of this paper, uh, so gave me a lot of insights to really work on this. So therefore, uh, I, I think uh, one of the issues that perhaps uh, even today we need to do uh, more research uh, in this particular area, uh, is to explore the possibility of writing an emotional history or the uh, history of mentality of, uh, you know, Kerala. Because my, uh, most of, I mean, my studies have been focused on the history of Kerala. So that's why I'm just uh, taking these examples. But I think the, uh, the larger questions are uh, quite uh, universal or that, or maybe global in nature, you find, uh, things being articulated in uh, other parts of the uh, world as well. So uh, this uh, particular question remains as a, a problem to be addressed. And the other point that I found uh, quite uh, significant was, uh, in fact, uh, uh, when I was, uh, you know, when uh, the editors of the book wanted me to further think about uh, this love and revolution, 
and uh, I had to go back to my archive very carefully to see how I do justice to this. So that was the most difficult part of it because uh, in none of, uh, most of those materials that I have been dealing with as historian sources, they don't uh, directly talk about uh, these two problems, uh, but then it is a, uh, it, it, for me, it was a struggle uh, with these sort of archival materials to understand, uh, you know, at which point of time this uh, whole question of emotions get submerged and there is a subterranean life for uh, this sort of things. And then to, cap and then to uh, follow those moments and then to talk about that, that was uh, uh, the challenge that I faced. So there was an eruption of uh, some kind of longing uh, that we find uh, articulated in social movements and so on. So uh, this is something uh, probably following uh, the introduction where the three editors talked about the problem space. And I thought, I think that was the problem space which uh, I was working along and entering into a conversation with, which I'm sure uh, much more is to be done as having listened to particularly Uday and uh, Sanil. And I think this conversation uh, needs to be continued, particularly in the kind of troubled times when, in fact, uh, referring to civil war, kind of civil war and other kinds of politics, and also the ways in which uh, th this uh, sort of politics is unfolding. I think still there is uh, space for critical social sciences and history. Uh, and you know the work of historians uh, to deal with uh, these questions of affect and aesthetics. So I stop here and uh, thank you very much for this wonderful occasion and uh, great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Mohan. Um, we don't have any comments till now in the chat box. Professor Michael Thurman, so would you like to add to the discussion at this point while we wait for the uh, comments to come? Uh, <clears throat> Rachel, you have got uh, questions or comments from? We, no, no, uh, we don't have comments uh, till now, except for people who have shared their excitement about the program. Okay, thank you. So um, shall we move on to the editor's responses? Yes. yes. Okay. I think we should ask Anu to go first. <laughs> I was just typing a addition. <laughs> <laughs> a point to support you in thanking Uden and Sanil and Paolo and Sanil. Uh, so let me just do that orally then. Thank you so much. We are so grateful. Um, most of all, I think to be in the middle of this wonderful gathering of friends, uh, let me once again say that I would really have loved this program to have been at least in the hybrid mode, if not in person. Uh, I truly hope that KCHR will be able to host something vibrant and exciting here in continuation with some of the conversations we've been having. Um, I am not going to respond in that sense. Uh, both Uden and Sanil, Sanil have been um, interlocutors uh, for uh, us individually and collectively as a project. Um, and very long histories of conversation have really made 
uh, a volume like this possible because one of the things that we discovered while we were working, especially when the uh, workshops were happening and as Sanil mentioned, the winter schools uh, and the uh, sort of little space that we had at that point uh, to discuss, you know, what the shape of the volume should be and so on. One of the interesting kinds of ways in which the discussions took a turn uh, was also in terms of shared libraries. Um, and there is something there about reading and thinking and acting. And I think we do need to actually bring some of that back because one of the big problems that faces us and uh, which, um, you know, in the contributions to this volume and certainly in the discussions that are happening at that time uh, and, and off the main sort of venues of the workshop, mm -hmm. many of us have reflected upon, is the complicated relationship with intellect uh, in relation to revolutionary politics, for example. And, you know, how does one actually think about, you know, what constitutes these and how these are thought about and the manners in which uh, we navigate this. And uh, we see this a lot in ongoing protest movements, our own kind of um, performative politics, our slogans, our, um, you know, um, the, the kinds of political writing we do and so on. And even though it is underwritten by thought very often, the way in which we address the question of action, uh, interestingly enough, it seems to me, sometimes can, uh, even though not actively, but in other ways become a kind of disavowal. So I think there's a complicated relationship here. And so for that reason, I'm really happy that both Uden and Sanil uh, indicated one kind of question, which of course, uh, I think is central to most of our contemporary concerns, which is how do we, instead of thinking love and revolution, how do we think love and hatred? I mean, are we thinking about these as um, antonyms? You know, is it, it are these oppositional, or are is this a pairing that needs to be thought through in all its complexity? And let me give you what might seem to be a slightly frivolous example, but it's something that I've thought about again and again in more recent times, given the state of Indian politics and the kinds of political movements many of us have been involved in um, in different parts of the country, at least. Uh, Looking at the kinds of, and partly because many of us are also teaching in university contexts and younger people are involved in movements and one is part of their larger struggles. Um, one of the kinds of thematics that's come up again and again is to address the issue of love. Right? We need love, not hatred is the way, you know, we, we speak against hate speech, we want love, we want a politics that speaks about, you know, the way in which one might bridge what are seen as, um, you know, real fractures is to be done through the work of love. Though interestingly enough, the way in which this is articulated, uh, the usually commonly used phrase amongst a younger generation is rise in rage to speak about love. Now, this is something that has per perplexed me hugely. How do you rise in rage to speak about love, right? How do you rise in rage to speak against hate? Uh, there is something really actually important here. What is it about the call to action that does not uh, involve evoking a language of lovingness? Uh, more recently, people have been in the context of Palestine and other places, which have, of course, seen a far longer and far more violent history uh, in an everyday sense for a very long period of time. People have been speaking about different kinds of issues, um, both in terms of, you know, um, a, a kind of martyrdom politics, but also in terms of mercy and compassion. Now, these are words, again, that we do not often uh, associate with revolutionary politics. And it struck me that there is something here that we do want to think about. And how do we speak to both these kinds of things? And one other small example, uh, almost, I think it's now a little over a decade ago that uh, Australian missionary in Orissa, Graham Staines, and his two children were burnt alive uh, 
uh, by uh, members of one of the factions of the uh, Sangh Parivar, which is the uh, uh, Hindu right uh, front. Now, um, subsequently, his wife, uh, who is also a, a missionary in her own right, she said that she forgave the people who murdered her husband and children. Now, this is something again that I have struggled to understand because this does not actually lend itself. Forgiveness does not, in the face of such hatred, does not lend itself to an easy understanding. It's actually the difficulty of understanding it which must provoke us to think. How do we work with, what is the genealogy of such forgiveness? What does it mean for her to do that? Now, in response to that, one of the people who was involved in burning the missionary and his children actually converted to Christianity, right? And now he goes around trying to make amends. So there are very fascinating kinds of movements. The ground on which we speak about many of the things that we are speaking about now, we are living through uh, hugely, uh, violently transformatory times, um, actually speak to both these kinds of issues, uh, either simultaneously, uh, but not necessarily by actually dissociating these or seeing these as antics. The second set of relationships, uh, even if Sanil will say these aren't relationships that I want to speak about, is the kind of pairing of friendship and democracy. And this is again, of course, there's a very long history, of, of particularly within you know, philosophy and Western philosophy of thinking about this. But there is something about um, the fact, speaking purely from an Indian point of view here, that the only group that's speaking about fraternity in that sense, uh, a kind of body of you know, either kindred or friendly, a fraternity, a brotherhood, is again the Hindu right. They are the ones who speak the language in a sense of friendship and kinship. None of the other political formations are able to embrace that. And what is the problem that we face when we speak to the contemporary moment of Indian democracy, which at many, many times in recent times doesn't even seem like what we imagine such a democracy to be. So there are questions about emancipatory politics, which we all have fantasies about, and the reality of living through uh, sort of a kind of dystopic uh, everydayness, which doesn't lend itself to any kind of, you know, uh, possibility of decoding this. So this is, you know, and I speak about this and, you know, both Kudan and Sanil uh, pick this up, of course, because, you know, it is striking about this volume that despite the fact that we are speaking about revolutions and, and love and revolution, there is actually a very strong kind of tone of despair that uh, is running through this volume. And even the ones uh, who have a certain kind of rebellious gregariousness, shall we say, be it Javed's paper or uh, Malarika's on outlaw emotions, and I'm really happy she wrote that, uh, or uh, um, Simona's in a very different kind of way. I think the general kind of um, tone is somber. So what is it about revolutions? Uh, the afterlife of revolutions, the afterlife of freedom struggles, the afterlife of all of this, and, and the question that uh, uh, Ramesh posed right at the beginning, what is it about the contemporary moment of the post-colonial uh, that we need to think about when we uh, go back and perhaps reread this or try and take this forward? Thank you so much. So, so I don't want to add too much to that. I mean, it's a really crisp note to, to draw some of this to a close, I suppose. Um, you know, it, it would be useful for us to think a little bit about uh, a set of 
conversations about how to take this forward. And so I just want to leave it there. But um, and just to, to to thank the 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 present, you know, Sunil, um, Odea, Paolo, and Sanal for, you know, I think setting forth an agenda for us to 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 think with. Um, I mean, I've got some thoughts about, you know, where to take some of the conversations that I ended the paper on. Um, and hopefully, you know, in a less despairing tone to, to end somewhere in Cape Town on another ship of, of fools, as we called it, um, you know, and hopefully this time not sailing off into the sunset or to nowhere. So thank you very much for hosting us. I mean, I think this has been a very important and valuable conversation. And hopefully we can pick up on some of the questions that were put to us uh, in the next set of conversations. Thank you. Professor Hayes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I am so excited by all the possibilities and directions in which we might push some of these questions. And I am just so deeply struck again by the richness of the conversations that it's possible to have, even in these very sensorially attenuated ways that we have virtually. Um, so just to express very profound thanks for all the speakers today, but to respond on one or two um, levels, I, I think there's something very particular about the archives of affect that have been gestured towards that in fact could be so important in continuing with um, and and in fact um, you know Sanal has spoken very suggestively about this too just now where that tone of despair or the this note of uh, somberness that runs through through the book um, would seem to have to do with one of the characteristics of revolutionary movements, which is their subscription to the progressive linear model of chronological time that is going to deliver us, as we've been saying, into the future perfect. And that the, the eschatologies that go with that, the the you know religious genealogies of that as well um it places a kind it, it sort of lines up the emotional phases that we are going to go through because it is there is a problem at the very heart of that model of temporality that we have not tackled enough and that is why i think the the archives of the, let's say the aesthetic are so full of possibilities because if we think about um, even uh, a photograph, um, and it's been one of the great joys of these conversations that we've been able to move between so many different mediums. But if I think about the way a photograph organizes space and time, it is so different from our logocentric expectations that it opens up these quite remarkable splinters where you can access another order of things. And I think that we need to go more deeply into some of those questions across the different mediums that we are working with, because that also addresses the problem we have with the way our expectations are built upon a naturalized temporality that we start here and we're going to end up in another place which we think we know and we end up very far from there that's the space we inhabit um, i'm also very intrigued by the possibility of looking at disaffection in other settings than india and i think we have shied away from this in southern africa I think it's a way that we should start to think about the xenophobic impulses that are very much at grassroots level in this particular country. 
that is a very terrible return for the support that other African countries gave for the liberation struggles that we had and supporting movements in exile. So just some um, responses to what has been said so far, which um, I've enjoyed tremendously. Thank you, everyone, again. Thank you so much. Professor Michael Pergen, shall we bring the discussion to an end? Uh, uh, you, you will be offering a formal Word of thanks, I presume. Yeah, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank everyone for making uh, this very, very exciting uh, experience that I had. I could listen to some uh, very, very penetrating observations about uh, a subject which I would. Uh, really discussing with some fussy subjects you know, fussy kind of um, and and the book itself uh, is outstanding and the discussion that we had was uh, also quite outstanding I wish to thank Uday Kumar and Sanil for uh, so, so Sanil for their uh, observations as well as uh, the three uh, editors whose uh, presence and their um, presentations made uh, really a difference. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, Sandil Mohan and Paolo for their presentations too. So um, this was quite a wonderful, wonderful evening. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor Michael Karagin. Uh, once again, it was a delight for KCSR to have been able to organize a lively discussion on such an important volume. And uh, Professor Uday Kumar and Professor Sanil, thank you for being a part of this discussion and also the contributors to the volume. Um, I would like to thank the editors for for the volume itself. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you all here. We look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you. Thank you.